Hello, everyone. Welcome to another episode of the Pain Consultants USA podcast. Dr. Bonner here with Dr. Connor, and we are lucky to have today as a guest, Dr. Yoav Suprun, who is a physical therapist. He is a faculty uh, in McKenzical, uh, excuse me, McKenzie Diagnosis and Treatment. Um, we're very happy to have him today as we refer many patients to McKenzie Physical Therapist, uh, and he's here today to talk more about that and talk about how uh, McKenzie therapists specifically help uh, with, we'll mostly talk about back pain today, but many other types of pain. So Yoav, thanks for being here today. Yes, uh, thanks for having me. Yeah, of course. Um, why don't you tell us a little bit about your background and how you got into physical therapy initially? So started, uh, I was in the Israeli Air Force uh, from 1990 to 94, came to America. My dad is American, so I came in 95 with a passport to New York City. And uh, I'm a son of a therapist. My mom is a therapist. My three sisters, we're all working with the body. So I uh, wanted to be a personal trainer. Unfortunately, in America, it took me a very short period of time to become a personal trainer, read a book by the American Council on Exercise, ACE, did a CPR course, and here I am in Manhattan on a high-end gym. Within two weeks of, of, of studying the books, I became certified, and I unfortunately injured a lot of my clients. I never understood what mechanical pain is. When people will tell me, you know, I get up from sitting position or or, or getting out of the car and my back is stiff and as I walk, I'm limping and my butt hurts. As a personal trainer, I always told them, stretch your piriformis, make sure you have good length in your hamstrings, stand, stand in the morning with a hot shower to hit your back, you know, so you warm up the muscles. I always thought it's muscular. I never knew what the difference is between pain that's coming as a result of nerve that's being angry or being annoyed versus true muscular issues. Um, and so when someone had back pain, in some cases, I would put them on a, on a massage table or treatment table and I would stretch them. I would, I would have them hug their knees to the chest. I would lean on them. I would tell them to do posterior pelvic tilts and cat-cow an opposite arm and leg, you know, things that I kind of learned from other trainers. And some of my clients fired me because I actually made them worse. And I would get complaints like, I don't know what we did. I think you overstretched my leg. Maybe you tore my hamstring. I didn't know that I aggravated sciatica. What did I know? So after injuring enough clients, I said, okay, I got to get better. NYU opened the first program on the East Coast. DPT doctorate, doctorate in physical therapy. Invested a lot of money, a lot of time to study the body, got good education, went to work for one of my professors. She recommended I'll take McKenzie part A. We have ABCD credentialing exam. We have a couple of other additional advanced courses. Uh, I'm a faculty with the Institute. And in part A, I just saw people coming in with a cane, with a walker. Some of, them had, some of them had what's called a lateral shift where they're coming into the course standing like so, walking like so. And I see an instructor, a guy named Dana Green, in four days giving them exercises to do specific one exercise or two exercises and the patients got better. And I said, what is this? How come you can adjust, you can teach a patient to take care of themselves. I thought I always have to do it on my own. I thought it has to be my hands or something that I apply to the patient. And so I took part B, which is the cervical spine, pain that radiates from the neck into the shoulder blades or even developing into a headache. Something like that, where you see in red here is actually pain that is felt in the muscles, but it's not a muscular problem. It's a compressed nerve somewhere in the cervical spine causing you to feel all these weird sensation, sensations. And I never realized that a lot of the things we do at home is the culprit. So I myself had eight months of pain on the left side of the neck into my upper trapezius, 
I kept stretching away from the pain because that's what humans do. When we feel pain, we usually, we play piano on it, we rub it, and then we <laughs> stretch away from the pain. And I was stretching to the right because the pain was on the left. And in this course, I started to do specific exercise that Dana, again, I took another course with Dana Green, that was part B, and I got resolved in one weekend. I could barely turn my head to the left. I had shoulder blade pain. My shoulder was bothering me. And in one weekend, I got resolved because I did something that was totally different from what I thought I should do. And then I saw the light. I was like, wow. This is remarkable. And I started studying it more and more intensively, took all the courses, repeated the courses, um, and eventually became faculty. And now we're teaching, uh, I'm a senior faculty with the Institute. We're teaching now virtually because of the pandemic, everyone is studying from home, but the courses are doing well. And the most important and the best thing is we are teaching patients to take care of themselves. That's the most, uplifting news is most people should know and should have a basic knowledge of mechanical pain. What does it mean to experience mechanical pain and how not to fear it and definitely not to believe the pharmaceuticals that you need to be on something to have a good quality of life. So that's in a nutshell where I am right now. Fantastic. Uh, I have a question for you about getting educated as a physical therapist, is there talk of the McKenzie method? Is that something you learn at all during typical physical therapy school? Or is that something you only get afterwards when you do the specific courses? Great question. PT school in general is a buffet of techniques. You learn multiple techniques that are being used in the market. You obviously cannot delve in depth into all of them. So we got maybe an hour of what McKenzie is. You, you, you learn multi, multitude of different techniques to treat, but really the, the continuing education is the big, big business in America. Because once you graduate, PT school prepared me to pass the licensure, but you really don't know how to treat until you start taking continuing education courses after you get your your state licensure. I'm licensed in, in New York State and obviously in Florida, I'm in Miami Beach where my office is. Um, so that's when really you dive into courses and, and you start to really see the benefit of, you know, and there's thousands of courses available. So PTs are often, you know, bombarded with, you know, come take our course, take our course. And it's, it's, a, it's a competitive market. And so um, it's really nice to see right now that even through uh, Zoom, we can teach students what the basics of mechanical pain is, what one should know and should do when he's seeing a patient with either neck, back, shoulder, hip, knee. Uh, the McKenzie method encompasses the whole body, not just the spine. Um, it was really a brilliant discovery what McKenzie, what McKenzie discovered that the majority, he was a manipulative therapist. He started his career as someone that would come and move the joints, but he realized, well, the patients can move their own joints if they know what is their directional preference. And so that's what we try to do when we, when we teach therapists is to, to First of all, make sure your patient knows when they leave your office, they know how to fish. Don't feed them the fish. Give them the tools to take care of themselves. And that's beautiful, especially now, now during the pandemic when people, when people cannot go or don't want to go to a doctor's office, to a healthcare provider. They, what can I do Saturday morning, 10 a.m.? I want to play golf. My back hurts. Can I take care of myself? And the answer often is yes. Yeah, and I think that's why Bill and I are such big proponents of this because you really give the patients the tools uh, for an active-based kind of recovery. Um, mm -hmm. So for patients who you know, maybe aren't uh, local in your area, um, how do patients find like McKenzie-based or McKenzie-certified therapists? And, and what goes into the certification? Is it the, the four 
or five courses you mentioned, or can you do one of the courses and be certified within, you know, lumbar or how does that work? So you have to go through A, B, C, D and get the certification after that. Unfortunately, there are therapists who say I'm McKinsey trained, but they only took part A or part B. You need to go through the whole certification program and, and pass a rigorous exam that is a whole day, both uh, written as well as hands-on where you're being evaluated for your manual skills and knowledge. Um, there is the extremities are also being introduced now uh, into the exam itself. So it's not only spine, it's also extremities, shoulder, hips, elbow, wrist, knee, ankle. Um, so it's, it's, it's a lot to, to be certified. And then on top of that, there is the diploma program, which involves even heavier, deeper studying with, with, with other diplomats where you do a clinical, uh, clinical site studies, including you know, working purely all day, doing MDT from morning to evening, as well as uh, online with students from around the world. So you know, I dove into it because again, I fixed my neck. And once you can feel the pain and then you can resolve it and you can prevent it from you know, occurring again, um, it's, it's, it's an eye opener. Then it's very easy to teach it to the patients. It's very easy to teach it to students because I don't need to sell what I do. All I need to do is explain or tell a story and people just feel it and it's beautiful. Does it work all the time? No. Some people, do they need injections? Sure. Some people need surgery? Sure. But the assessment works on everyone, whether you have been fused, whether you have been injected, injected, whether you had, uh, wh whether you were told you have degenerative disc disease, whether you told you have bone on bone, all those sad things that patients were told uh, are just another reason to choose a mechanical therapist, which is what I do, to make sure the person is getting evaluated and assessed for both the, sim the mechanics as well as the symptoms. Yeah, I think you would agree. I think we talk about a lot how, you know, all the imaging has, it, it all says lots of things, but most of it doesn't mean anything most of the time. You got to see what the symptoms are. And, and just like you said, what, what does it respond to? Uh, so maybe, I don't know if you could like walk us through what, what a basic assessment would be for like a typical, you know, the most common thing we see is low back pain and then low back pain radiating into one or both legs. Like what would a typical uh, assessment involve for one of those patients? So first of all, it's, you know, you ask a patient questions. What, what brought you here? Okay. What is making a person, how long do you have it? Where is your pain? Someone says, my pain is uh, lower back and then radiating to my right knee. Okay, anything on the left side? Well, it used to be on the left side, but now it's not there. That's an important component. I need to shade that into my, into my assessment sheet. I want to know the whole history. Uh, anything in your foot? Well, my foot used to be numb, but now it's just to my hamstring. Well, I have to shade all the way down to the foot. I need to know the whole history. Where is it? How long do you have it? Does it come and go? Uh, is it constant or intermittent? Oh yeah, it's, 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 it's a chronic problem. Patients are confused between chronic, constant, and consistent. And you gotta, you, gotta, you gotta help patients understand, do you feel, well, today I'm not feeling it. Today is a good day, doc. Well, that's beautiful. Well, it's not constant, but I felt it yesterday. Okay, so it's intermittent. Yeah, but it's a chronic problem. I understand. But if, it's, if it comes and goes in the past month, you have good and bad days, what I know, it's usually not inflammatory. So you don't need to be an anti-inflammatories. If you had a couple of good days and then a couple of bad days and it alternates, maybe it's mechanical. When do you hurt? Then comes the better, worse questioning. Well, whenever I sit in my car and I drive over 45 minutes to Palm Beach, 
my sciatica is raging. I get out of the car, the first couple of steps, I can barely walk. Then I walk, I feel better. I get into the mall and I walk for half an hour, my sciatica kicks in again. Oh, interesting. So both sitting and standing walking bothers you. That tells me something. So I'm collecting information. The first part of the assessment is a lot of um, questioning of the patient. I'm building, I always say to my student, I'm like a CIA, FBI, and Mossad agent when a patient comes to my office. Mossad is the Israeli Secret Service, those of you who don't know. Mm -hmm. um, I, I, I pull a lot of pieces of information. I interrogate, I ask, how do you feel when you're lying down? Well, you know, I can only lie on my right side. If I lie on my left side, it's really shh, within an hour, my leg pain gets or my back hurts more. Um, how do you feel when you wake up in the morning? How do you feel as the day progress? How do you feel in the evening? What happens to you? Is bending a bad thing or a good thing? Are you stiff when you get up from sitting or is there's no stiffness? There's a lot of, can you stand in a cocktail party? Um, you know, there's a lot of questions that I collect information on. And then obviously I look for anything sinister. Sinister is something that doesn't, something that sounds strange. For example, not a good thing if a patient, as you guys know, tells me I have unremitting back pain, no position in bed gives me relief, and I'm losing weight unintentionally, we need an MRI of your spine like yesterday, because something doesn't sound right. That's not very common. The chance of us seeing it in our career is around two, 3%, as you guys know, but I wanna make sure there's nothing sinister there. How's your bowel and bladder, any difficulty urinating, any difficulty with bowel movement? Um, what happens to you when you sneeze or cough? And people, you know, people start to give you information. I can get into underwear uh, in the evening, but in the morning I can barely get into my underwear and pants. My back is so stiff in the morning. Or I wake up in the morning and I have a shift as I'm going to the bathroom or I'm stuck forward. So all this is pieces of information of the puzzle. That's the history. And then I start to move them around. I, I, the other side of the assessment is to look for baselines, basically um, neurological baselines, muscular reflexes, any dural tension. I move them around. I ask them to do certain things. And then I do a movement loss assessment where I actually ask the patient, stand with your feet, shoulder width apart, hands in front of your thighs, bend as far as you can while running your hands down your legs as far as you can forward. What happens to your pain when you do that? Where is the pain? Okay, you collect information, place your hands in the small of the back, bend as far as you can, as far as you can, as far as you can backward. What happens to you then? What do you feel? I look at their mechanics when they move their hips all the way one side, all the way to the other side. So all of that helps me collect you know, mechanical information on, on movement loss. And then we start to try to find out specific exercises that will change those baselines. So it could be someone that comes to my office and they cannot walk on their toes, they're dropping, they have, or they cannot walk on their heels, they have a foot drop or searing pain down the leg. And uh, by the end of the session, hopefully all of a sudden the pain moves out of the leg into the back. That's a very good thing, by the way, for your listeners to know. There's a phenomena called centralization that the public is not aware of extremely important personal trainer as a personal trainer i never knew this you can see the arrows by the way this is from treat your own back by robin mckenzie i make nothing out of this this is 10 bucks on amazon you guys should definitely check it out but centralization i'll show you right here centralization is the movement of pain to a more central location centralization of pain that occurs as you exercise is a good sign You'll be shocked, guys, to know how many people are afraid of back pain. 
So when their searing leg pain is moving into their back, they think they're actually getting worse. And so what do they do? They hold on to their you know, kitchen counter and they stretch their back or they immediately cross their leg to stretch or they do what so many people love, which is the child's pose. They go right into a child's pose to stretch it or they hug their knees to the chest or they sit in a hot tub with Epsom salts trying to alleviate the back pain and then the sciatica or the leg pain often starts to come back. And so educating a patient as to where the pain should and should not be is also part of the assessment. And that was the beauty of Robin McKenzie. He was such a great educator where he took the, per the, the patient through a journey of education and obviously empowerment. And that's what made him, the, you know, the great clinician and voted the most influential clinician in orthopedic physical therapy. I believe it was 2010 or 2011 that he was voted in the United States most influential clinician in orthopedic physical therapy. And, and that centralization, that is a good prognosis for patients, right? I mean, that's what we talk about is if you can find a movement that gives you that centralization, you're likely not going to need other significant forms of treatment beyond the appropriate physical therapy, right? Correct, correct, correct. And it's, and it's, it's baffling for patients because they never thought about the geographical location of pain. People get scared when their neck hurts, but yet they feel somewhat better when the neck feels better, as, but now it's in my shoulder blade or in my arm or elbow, they're not realizing there's actually a worsening reaction going on. Um, when the back pain becomes hamstring tightness, they start to stretch their hamstring, not realizing they shouldn't stretch their hamstring. There's, there's a time and a place to stretch. And don't get me wrong, guys, it's important to keep flexibility in, in your muscles. But if you feel pain in one side of the body, let's say post-exercise, post-spinning, post-yoga, post-pilates, post-gyrotonics, post-kettlebells, if you're getting up in the morning and you're feeling pain in one buttock or down one leg or combined with a stiffness or some kind of a mechanical obstruction to motion in your spine, don't be fooled to think or don't fall into the common belief that this is muscular problem. You're dealing with a mechanical, what, what we call a derangement, a mechanical uh, obstruction, a change in, in, in a resting position of a joint in the spine causing you to feel it down the leg and it is not your leg, it is your back. And, and that's, you know, that's one of the fun things of, of, of doing what I do is on daily basis, I get patients shocked. Oh, it's not my tennis elbow. It's not my golfer's elbow. It's not my knee. I don't need uh, a knee replacement. I don't need a arthroscopic shoulder rotator cuff repair. No. 47, the latest research that came out of Canada by uh, Rosedale et al. Great research. It's called uh, the XPAS study, uh, extremity pain of spinal source. 47% of shoulder pains are spine related. I believe 71% of hip pain is spine related. Um, I have patients, two patients right now, replace their knee. They didn't need it. The knee pain didn't come from the knee joint. The knee pain is coming from their spine. So it's, it's amazing. It's fun to do what I do because you're able to educate as you're assessing. And that's really important. And, and you kind of hit on an important topic there where I think sometimes clinicians may rely more on imaging uh, than you know physical exam or, or history taking. Are there certain instances in your evaluation and treatment where, uh, say, an MRI can be useful, like um, as far as maybe uh, changing your approach uh, at managing someone? Or I would often, I would wait on sending someone to an MRI, especially if someone tells me I have good and bad days, good and bad weeks. 
I will tell them, listen, if you go get an MRI, if you want to get it for baselines, fine. But I'm telling you that if you're getting an MRI and you're over the age of 40, there's a very good chance, and you're pain-free, there's a very good chance you're going to have two to three sentences there that are going to scare you. And the psychological fear, by the way, it's done predominantly in the United States. It's very hard in a lot of countries to get a justifiable MRI. When do you get an MRI? I am trying to pee and I can't pee. I'm defecating on myself uncontrollably. We need an MRI to rule out coda equina. I'm losing weight unintentionally. The common answer is, when I ask a patient, are you losing weight unintentionally? The common answer is I wish. <laughs> right? People like, I wish. Uh, no, not a good thing. So we need an MRI to investigate further. But, but an MRI will find, you know, will find what's so common is being told to patients, you are, you are degenerated and you have a disease. It's called degenerative disc disease. What a terrible connection of words to freak a patient out. And patients come to my office and I ask them, you have good and bad days? Yeah, there's weeks I'm fine. My back doesn't hurt my leg. What happened to your degenerative disc disease on those weeks? Oh, that's a good question. What happens to your stenosis then? Oh, that's a good question. Bone doesn't just psh, appears and disappears. It's either there or it's not there. So it's really important to make sure that whoever goes to get an MRI should expect sad news, whether they're in pain or not. Furthermore, a lot of the MRIs are lying down machines. So if you take the spine, which is a structure that requires for us to see best any, any, any um, changes within the structures in the spine, and you put a person in the machine this way, you unweigh the spine, and then you move them in, take an imaging, you may miss certain things that are going on there. So I tell patients, if you have to get an MRI, try to go to a facility that will give you a stand-up MRI. Um, we'll get a better picture with that, when the, with the thorax weight on it, as opposed to you being unloaded. And the technician usually moves your pelvis, which changes the picture to begin with. People, by the way, that have a shift, a lateral shift, they go into an MRI, the technician will realign their pelvis prior to getting them into the 45 minute imaging process. And that can alter certain things. So it's better to see someone loaded. Yeah. It's amazing to see a difference. I had a couple of patients where did, you know, the conventional MRI, then we actually did a seated MRI because it was all uh, seated base pain. And I mean, the size of the disc uh, herniation was, I mean, at least three times. Really? Yeah, it was crazy. Listen to hear that. And I that love- correlates with, you know, what we see, I think, clinically, you know, like, oh, I don't have any pain when I lay down. But if I sit in my chair for 30 minutes, I get pain in my back, and then it spreads down my leg. And it, I mean, it makes perfect sense. Like, mechan- like you're talking about, it's a mechanical problem, the, the disc comes out, the disc then presses on the nerve, you get the pain, you get into a good position again, and it goes away. And that's the it, it makes sense. It's just, you know, we can't always rely on the tests. You know, like you said, like if you had an MRI while laying down, you have no pain while laying down. How important was that MRI? Whereas, you know, maybe if you have pain when you're standing and you get the standing one, like you said, it could look totally different. So, yeah. And though, you know, it's important also to remember, and as we're teaching this, there's disagreement among the top spinal anatomists in the world as to what is the pain general, what structure. Is it a facet? Is it a ligament? Is it a disc? Is it, is it a cyst that's growing there? What is it? Um, what I tell patients, if a patient comes to the office and they give me their MRI and they're like, I have an L4, L5 problem and I need you to educate me about the disc, I'll take them on the disc train and <laughs> show them everything they need to learn and see and literally I have all the models that will demonstrate what a fissure is and what, you know, basically what McKenzie uh, developed his original theoretical model that something moves out of place and squeezes on a nerve. However, there are patients who are coming here and they're like, 
I don't know what's wrong with me. I have back pain. I have, you know, here's my MRI. What do you think? I have leg pain, whatever. So I wouldn't even go into the disc story because you can, you can freak a patient out by calling a structure and saying, that's your problem. You know, so what do I use? I use mechanics. So here's your spine. And you're telling me that when you're sitting for a prolonged period of time, your leg pain increases or your back becomes stiff. So this is an S curvature, left butt, right butt. This is a C curvature. Does it matter which chair you sit on? I ask. And then I try to get into the mechanics of the spine. There's many structures here. The joints is surrounded by ligaments. There's the facets, the disc is in between, but there's a lot of, and I try to veer away from calling a structure or a pathoanatomical uh, title to your problem. And, and, I, and I talk more of the mechanics of how they move and still talk about centralization, talk about directional preference. Um, but the most important for a patient to understand is if you have good and bad days, don't believe that the MRI is the Bible. The MRI showed you a picture at that moment on that day. That picture can change just like your symptoms change. So don't become upset when you see severe degeneration or severe stenosis and you have good and bad days, that's fine. You have a mechanical problem. When it's moving one way, you have an issue. When it's moving the other way, your leg is, is, is fine. And that's what I encourage people to, be, to, to understand. Um, so I've got a question now, if we go through, like you go through an evaluation with somebody, you find a movement, uh, a couple exercises you want to focus in on someone who has a lot of pain, but gets relief with a specific movement or exercise. Can you, it's, it's obviously patient dependent, but, uh, is there some way you can say like, this is how often I want you to do this and this many times per day, this many times per hour, what would like a typical kind of prescription be? Is it stay in this position for a long time? Is it do this exercise every hour on the hour? You know, what, is there a, a general generalizable answer you could give to that? Great, great question. Because there are times that based on the history, remember when we talked before about the assessment process, there's uh, people say, when I sit for 10 minutes, I'm fine. I can get up, no problem. If I sit for an hour, sustained position of sitting bothers me. Then I start to think maybe I need to give them sustained position and not repeat it. Um, I'll give you an interesting story. My dad is 92 and uh, he developed leg symptoms. And my mom calls me, you know, can you ask him a few questions? I'm on the phone with him. You know, you really should never treat your family members uh, as a rule, but you know, my parents are in Israel. So I said to my dad, what do you feel? So when I walk, my legs feel like very tired. Both legs, yeah, both legs. Any back pain? No, I don't have any back pains. My legs are bothering me. I feel like I'm not taking my weight properly. Okay. Dad tried to, and, and I know he's sitting in his Archie bunker chair for hours. So uh, dad tried to lean against the kitchen counter. So let me leave, let me lift this up to a uh, kitchen counter. Usually is around 36 inches. I said, dad, try to lean against the kitchen counter with your box and try to bend backwards 10 times every one to two hours. So he's, I said, what happened when you do it? He says, ow. I said, what happened? He says, my back hurts when I do it. I said, dad, you know, there's a phenomenon called centralization. I don't understand. He says to me, I never had back pain. Now you gave me two problems. I had leg pain. Now you gave me back pain. I said, dad, you, you should continue. Forget it. My mom is like, you know what? Let him just go to therapy. And a month later, he sends me an email. So help me God sends me an email. This is what happened. He had a procedure done in his eyes and the doctor told him, Mr. Suprun, three times a day, you have to put an antibiotic ointment in your eyes and stay there for a minute. <laughs> and he sends me an email, the eye drops fix my sciatica. 
and I said to him, Dad, it's not that the eyes drops fix your sciatica, it's the fact that you were leaning back that fixed your problem. But then here is what he said, and he was right. You told me to move repeatedly into extension where I actually stayed here and that fixed my problem. And he was correct. He needed sustained versus repeated. So during the assessment process, goes back to your question, Bill, what is the home exercise program? First of all, the assessment determines if a person needs flexion, extension, frontal plane movement, uh, rotation stuff, but the assessment gives me information of what I may need. Some people will benefit from sustained, some will benefit from repeated. In general, people need to do something every two hours. One exercise in general, every two, maybe three hours um, for headaches, for pressure behind the eyes, for sensitivity in the skull. I've had a lot of patients respond to sustained position as opposed to repeated motions of the neck. Um, why? Because a lot of people hang out, you know, in their on their sofas, leaning, you know, watching TV, you know, let's say the television in there with pillows behind their neck in sustained protrusion, or they lie on their back with a with a cushion that's too thick in a protruded state, waking up in the morning with headaches or feeling foggy they may benefit from sustain, but in general, about every two to three hours. When you're evaluating uh, new patients, uh, you had alluded to, yeah, maybe this technique won't work for everybody, but I guess, uh, when do you make that determination? Is there a certain number of sessions you feel like, you know, if, if you have with a patient by then, with your you know, experience that you should be able to get some response? I want to know within three visits what's going on with you. Um, patients can come back better. Everyone's happy, open the champagne. Okay, patient can come back worse. Okay, mate, what do I need to change? Uh, what I don't like is I'm the same, I'm the same, I'm the same. Then we got to figure something out. And um, people ask me, what's your success rate? Honestly, I tell them it's about 75%. Some people say, well, that's not too high. I'm like, that's honest. If someone tells you I have 100% success, run. Because it's <laughs> dealing with people here. So I don't like, I'm a business owner. I don't like people to keep coming back saying I'm the same. This is not, it doesn't sit well with me. So I don't like to throw the same thing at the patient. So I'll try to provoke if I, first I'll try to, obviously find the, the right mo movement within the first session, but I may not find it on the first, so then I'll try something on the second. If I don't find it on the second, I'll try something on the third. But within, I would say three, maybe four, but within three, I like to know what's in front of me and how to attack it in general. Yeah, gotcha. Um, with some of, I guess, is there a, like a national registry or database that patients can look for McKenzie certified therapists sure, in their sure. area? Sure. So it's uh, the McKenzie Institute USA. McKenzie is M-C-K-E-N-Z-I-E. If you just Google the McKenzie Institute USA, you'll see we have a very organized website. You go to find a provider, you put your zip code, and you can look within 10, 25, 50 miles radius of therapists around you. Certified clinician will have CERT next to their name, CERT MDT. Diplomats will be bolded black. And those are people like myself who, who spend more time, dove into the method and uh, took the highest level of education and certification in the method. And um, yeah, definitely I recommend everyone to have an assessment. The assessment is a must on everyone. How Whether many? Go ahead. No, sorry. I was just going to say, how many uh, diplomas do you know? How many there are in the country, in the world? I mean, I think we are now at around, I believe, between five and six hundred diplomats around the world. Okay, great. Yeah. All right. So I want to take it the next step then. So the patient sees you, evaluated, two, three visits, they're feeling much better. So then, you know, you've been a trainer, you're also like an orthopedic certified physical therapist. 
when do you start taking them to the next level in terms of introducing opposite movements safely so that we're not kind of reprovoking the issue? Good. How long do you wait? Do you wait for a specific sign that you see, you know, things like that? Great question again. Um, people don't understand the McKenzie method, unfortunately. People associate it with only, you know, extension exercises and the cobra and just back bends. And patients should be aware that they, and I always say it on the first visit, you will hug your knees to your chest, you will bend forward in a chair and hold the legs of the chair and pull yourself forward. You will be bending in both directions because a healthy spine is a flexible spine. Um, I usually wait for a few days for, for their symptoms to be almost non-existent, maybe you know, just maybe slight central pain or discomfort with certain movements. And then I start what's called recovery of function. Um, I say to patients often, you will want to cancel your third or fourth visit. If I get it right, you will feel good. You will want to cancel your follow-ups because you'll be like, I'm pain-free. Why should I go and do another, you know, why, why should I continue? But if we don't remodel, and that's important, and I use the analogy of the finger. When you have a cut on your knuckle, you stop bending, the cut heals within a few days because you put a Band-Aid, maybe you put you know, some kind of a stick. The body lays collagen that is the crazy glue that the body uses to allow the tissue to heal. But if you take the Band-Aid off, now you have a scab. This scab, you can feel it. The only way to resolve the scab is to start to bend in the opposite direction, which is converting collagen, you know, getting into more of the physiology, certain type of collagen to a different type of collagen because the body repairs the tissues in, it, it's strong, the repair is strong, but it's not flexible. So you'll be reaching into the trunk of your car, or you'll take your daughter out of the car seat. And if you haven't moved in this direction, you can, you know, create, recreate the problem. So it's important that patients understand that what's the pathway I'm gonna take them through. And I try to do it on visit one, maybe sometimes it's on visit two, where they see they're gonna move in both directions. But if every hour you're gonna be doing this, and if you're gonna be slouching tonight watching an NBA game, or if you're not taking your lumbar roll, you know, for your breakfast, lunch, dinner, you're not sitting properly, you're not doing what I'm asking you to do, we're going to have a, a longer you know, period of, of trying to get to that recovery of function. So it's the education, that's the most important thing. It's the education and empowerment, letting patients know that they have to do their exercises regularly. We will get you to restore motions in every direction. I'll get you to do what you want to do, whether it's golf or tennis or or basketball, but there is a time and a place to when we take the Band-Aid off and start to move in the opposite direction. So symptoms response uh, will guide me, uh, obviously the mechanics, but what the patient cares the most about, about is the symptoms. And so I'll wait for a few days, they'll text me, call me, say, hey, I'm feeling really good. Can we schedule a, you know, a recovery of function? Uh, remodeling session, and then they come in and we start slowly with, with lighter forms of movements in the opposite direction, then we load it further, then we load it further, and then we start to go into sports specific, whether it's plyometrics or, or tennis or golf, whatever it is that they want to do, I'll get them to do, but they have to understand how to take care of themselves when they are not with me. That's the most important thing. You know, it, going back to your point where I think traditionally people associate McKenzie with extension, uh, a lot of patients that we see too in the, you know, elderly who may have, you know, symptoms consistent with like spinal stenosis and uh, neurogenic claudication, you know, traditionally maybe aren't big fans of extension. I mean, in your practice, will you treat 
some of those patients as well? And is that where you will employ more flexion based or are you still able to find uh, a position of extension that seems to work, whether it's with some, you know, pelvic movement or different pressures applied? So again, I will not treat the MRI findings. You wouldn't know that someone is stenotic or degenerated unless you had an MRI. I will treat, I will first move them around and try to find directional preference. If someone has sciatica, like my dad, and you know, older age, and he's telling me if I stay here for a minute, and my leg pain abolish, and now I'm feeling some back pain or discomfort in the back, I will encourage them to continue and do that. On the contrary, if someone is doing that and their legs light up like a Christmas tree, and the more I do it, the angrier their leg becomes, I'll be like, well, maybe there is no room. Maybe there is some narrowing or stenosis and I may investigate something different. Um, and that's, you know, I don't go by the age. In school, what we hear, what I learned, what a lot of students tell us, you know, I learned in school never to extend someone that has stenosis on imaging. Well, how do you know if the stenosis is relevant or not? How do you know if that is what's causing the patient's symptoms? And if you're afraid of moving them, you will never know. What else I tell students is, can you really make someone who has true spinal stenosis worse that will remain worse? And the answer is often no, because people who have true stenosis, what do they know? As soon as they sit down, right? I can shut down my symptoms. So I, as long as I, if there is true neurogenic radication, once they sit down, symptoms should subside. If someone sits down and the she or he are 75 or 80 and they tell me, which I see a lot, and then I really get excited. My legs are worse when I'm sitting. Here's my MRI, severe stenosis. I know, and you guys know, the stenosis is not their problem. Because if they're sitting and they're having leg problem, it's not because of stenosis. Sitting shouldn't make someone with stenosis hurt in their legs. Do they have it? Yes, on imaging. But is that their problem? I will challenge that. So I get excited. I move them and I try to see what's their directional preference. Yeah, sometimes severe stenosis is hard to ignore on an MRI because it's so impressive sometimes. But like you're saying, sometimes it just doesn't fit with the story. You know, it's like severe stenosis when you're sitting, shouldn't you shouldn't have any pain. You should be fine, uh, especially compared to standing. Like if standing feels good and sitting is bad, that just doesn't that doesn't make any sense. So it's uh, it, but it is when you sometimes you see it on an MRI and it's so severe, you're like how can that not be a problem for you? You know, it's just like all the nerves are cramped. It doesn't make any sense, but it's just another important, you know, point about imaging, not being, uh, the imaging doesn't dictate the symptoms. And I, I talk about that every single day with patients. I think like, it sounds like you do. So, uh, uh, is, uh let me ask, uh, is there, um, I'm assuming the answer is no, but is there like a, a rule of thumb? So uh, say a left-sided uh, flexion-based um, uh, symptoms traveling down the leg, you know, say, you know, posterior lateral thigh, even to the calf improves with extension. I mean, sometimes when you're trying to um, uh, feel things out or different positions, like, is there, would you usually side bend away first? Or like, if you're trying to add in side bending to see, um, is there a rule of thumb, whether you go towards or, or away from? So we have, there are certain curses in the world of MDT. One of them is abandoning the sagittal plane too quickly. So if we look at this model right now, Okay, here I'm showing two vertebrae uh, and a disc between them. And you can see right here a window that takes you inside. So what McKenzie theorizes is it, it's the fissures can move the center of the disc either 
posterior laterally, laterally, anterior laterally, or anterior. There, you know, it depends. It can move to 12 o'clock, 3 o'clock, 9 o'clock, 6 o'clock, 7 o'clock, different areas. If a person comes to you and they have a lateral shift, the theoretical model, if they're crooked, is that you will need to attack it in the frontal plane. So if they have, and again, this is a theoretical model. That's what McKenzie based his, his, his uh, career on. The theoretical model is that the jelly moved so far to three o'clock or nine o'clock that you will need. So that's when actually McKenzie received bad reputation because students that took just part A, took patients, laid them down, moved their hips, started to pump extensions in line, made a patient worse, searing leg pain. They got off the table much worse because you actually pushed more disc material into a lateral fissure. A fissure that goes into, let's say, six o'clock, five o'clock, seven o'clock, posterior lateral, as you mentioned, Chris, we would first, if there's no shift, we would first want to attack it in the sagittal plane. Usually that's, it's either going to fix the problem or it will expose the lateral component, the need to take the hips off center or to change something with the application of the exercise. So staying sagittal is really, really important. Um, I'll tell you what happened in my neck. It's an interesting story. As I'm taking part B, I started to do, and again, it's in McKenzie Treat Your Own Neck Book, another masterpiece. I start to do retractions and extensions of my neck. The more I did it, the worse I got. The more I did retraction, I stayed sagittal. My ability to rotate my neck to the left got worse. My upper trapezius got more angry and my shoulder blade on the left got angrier. I went back to my hotel room and I said, well, if I keep stretching all the way to the right to alleviate left side, pain, let me go to the left. This was my side bending to the right. This was my side bending to the left. I started to do 50, 100, 150, 200. I started to apply overpressure. All of a sudden, the obstruction that I had on my left side of my neck disappeared. Within a, within a period of few hours, I had full range of motion. My shoulder felt better than it did in months, all these trigger points that I kept pushing into were gone. I did feel left-sided neck pain. I centralized my problem by staying in the front, in the frontal plane and not in the sagittal. That's what I needed. It's not very common. Usually we want to start in the sagittal plane and then based on the symptoms and the mechanics change either take the hips of center or play with the neck or the head uh, moving in the frontal or maybe in a transverse plane. Again, depends on where the symptoms are. The method is, while it sounds simple, requires extensive training to know which direction to move a patient in. And that's why it's so important for, for your listeners to know that they should see someone who finished the credentialing program and, and, and delved into uh, intense education as much as possible uh, before they go and get treated. Do you, I guess, do you see patients sometimes that have responded, you know, perfectly back to activities and they're still, um, you know, they'll have symptoms intermittently, but they keep up with the, the uh, movement um, as you prescribed um, at some point kind of not respond to similar type movements? And then is it a matter of just kind of tweaking things a little bit? Uh, yes, so you can get a decrease, even abolishment of symptoms. Everything looks great. And then on visit four, they come back and like, I'm worse again. I've been doing the exercise, it's getting worse. You can have what's called a relevant lateral component that four o'clock or eight o'clock, where initially you pushed it in again, theoretical model, 
you pushed it in with sagittal motions. Did I freeze on you guys? Nope, you're good. No, nope. I'm good. All right, so I yeah. froze here. Um, where you initially uh, were able to resolve the problem, and now you expose the lateral uh, with just staying in the sagittal motion, then you discover actually, okay, now I know what's going on and the patient may need to do the exercise with hips off center. And that usually will get the patient better, you know, much quicker. But again, it's, it's not always clear cut. I mean, we all love, uh, oh, you abolished my leg pain, happy, you know, chocolate, flowers, champagne bottles, you're great, you're a miracle worker. That's not always the case, but that's, that's the fun thing about it is, Every patient is, is a world on its own. And as long as you give time, that's what's so great about my profession is I spend time with my patient. Initial eval in my office is 90 minutes. No one does it in Florida. No one does it in Florida. I am not cheap, but I give you the full love, attention, uh, focus, concentration, problem solving that my brain can go to to get you out of pain. And again, I know it's, the, it's not the 90 minutes you're with me. It's the other 22 and a half hours you're not with me when you leave my office. It's how you sit in the car. Are you on your phone, on your toilet for half an hour every morning? What are you doing with your dogs? Are you carrying your kids only on one hips and not balancing? Are you slouching on your sofa? Are you sitting now during the pandemic on your kitchen counter working like so, you know? So many people are doing that and, and not realizing they're hurting themselves. So I get into the whole story and, and, you know, and try, to, try to guide the patient in the process as to what's going on in my head and why they should help themselves when they're not with me. And it's, it's a selling process. Patients are used to in America to come and get something done to them. We're here, I'm telling them, I'll give you the tools you know, the tools in the toolbox, but you have to know what to do when you leave my office. And that's, that's very empowering. I think you just named like six things that I do every day <laughs> that make my back hurt. <laughs> I have like a one-year-old and I always carry him on the right side. I'm like, I know this isn't good for me, but I can't carry him on the left side. He's too heavy. So. Get, well, the Tush baby, and I have nothing to do with that company. We bought it. Go on Amazon, Tush baby. It's it's a it's a uh, brace where you have your kids like a fanny pack, right? Still. You have to hold the kid. It's not yeah. a holster, right? But he or she can rest on it. Yeah, it actually gives me nice back support for a prolonged period of time. I just have the kid rest on it. Yeah, I have a friend who had that, and I I thought it looked like a really good idea. So, um, any other uh, very common tips you've been giving during quarantine? I mean, obviously, you said the well, any other like. Uh, assistive devices i would call them like that that you're talking about commonly um i like patients you know to you to to sit on higher chairs where their hips are above their knees not on low deep sofas i like patients my gentlemen that i treat i don't want you shaving if you have back pain i don't want you shaving over the vanity like so get a fogless mirror and do it in the shower or ladies instead of putting makeup like so do it you know, with a mirror that comes to you, you can buy a suction on mirrors on Amazon today. Um, I talk to patients about, you know, neck patients. Why are you hanging your head down? If we found that this is your directional preference, let's say, I want you to hold your phone with your, with your dominant hand and your non-dominant underneath phone at eye level. And now you can scroll with your thumb you can type with two thumbs. You don't need to hang the 10 pounds weight of the head in this direction. So, you know, it's a lot of little tips and tricks. If you sit all day and you're working sitting, I don't see any sense in doing spinning or Peloton bike, you know. Um, people have to walk, especially during quarantine. People are moving during the pandemic, moving less. Break the walking throughout the day, four or five segments of 20 minutes are better than an hour uh, or do an hour in the morning for aerobics, but then add more walking 
throughout the day, uh, do Zoom calls like I'm doing with you guys. I'm standing. I have the, the laptop elevated on a bar stool. I'll show it to you on top of my, um, on top of my uh, table, right? So here's, I have a bar stool right on and you can see, and I'm standing and I, I don't need to sit because, you know, I'm happy, I'm happy standing. Our body was meant to move. So that's common sense advice. Yeah, <laughs> I love it. I feel like uh, people need to to realize sometimes all it takes is common sense to, to manage some of these sessions. My biggest sentence I use on daily basis, less is more. Yeah. Okay. Uh, I think unless Chris has any more questions, I think we can probably call it there, Chris. No, I, I think that was great. I, I really appreciate your time. I think um, I, I think our patients definitely get some uh, great information from this. And, and I, I guess, you know, when I see a lot of patients, you know, we hear a lot, oh, I've been through physical therapy, it, it didn't work for me. So, so this is great to say, hey, listen, this is, this is not traditional physical therapy. This this really is a, a movement-based, uh, you know, uh, you're going to take an active uh, role in this. So hopefully for some of those patients who have been resistant to kind of traditional PT that we can motivate them with this option. Awesome. And Thank you guys for having me. Yeah. Where can, um, so where do you, uh, tell us where you see patients. So any patients who might be in those areas might be able to find you. Uh, so my my website is Sobe Spine S O B E it stands for South Beach SobeSpine.com. Okay. Uh, that's the clinic's uh, website, and then uh, for general education and corporation lectures, it's DrYoav.com D R Y O A V.com. Okay, great. Thank you so much. Thank you. Thank you, guys.